Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Infectious Disease virtual event. My name is Corey Watson. I'm an assistant professor um, in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Genetics at the University of Louisville School of Medicine. Um, today, I'm going to be uh, talking to you about some of our work in the immunoglobulin loci. Um, my talk is titled Overcoming Complexity to Elucidate the Role of Immunoglobulin Polymorphism on the and the Functional Antibody Response. So uh, I'm going to sort of deliver my slides today in two parts, um, really three. So I'm going to give a brief introduction, um, uh, sort of giving you some background on B cells and antibodies, um, uh, mostly focusing on what we know about the genetics of the genes that encode antibodies. And then I'm going to move into two uh, different but related sections um, highlighting some of the work that we are currently doing um, to deal with some of the issues that uh, face the field um, uh, with respect to interrogating antibody genetic diversity. So just a little background. Um, most of us are probably aware of the fact that, that B cells are critical components of the immune system and that they function in many different processes. Um, importantly, B cells are the only cells that produce uh, antibodies, proteins called antibodies. And antibodies are going to be the focus of our talk today um, in particular. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the antibodies are, these are uh, molecules that are composed of two identical heavy chains and two identical light chains as shown by the blue and red uh, cylindrical bars here in the oval on the right hand side of the slide. Um, and these antibody molecules are expressed by B cells either on their cell surface or are secreted, and they have many different functions um, in the immune system um, and, and are involved in both innate and adaptive immune responses. And so today we're gonna to be talking a lot about diversity and antibodies in particular, um, uh, how this diversity uh, arises. And so, um, sort of dumbed down uh, or layman's perspective on uh, antibody diversity, um, you can sort of boil down this idea by thinking about the world of pathogens that we face, uh, which tends to be rather diverse. And so our immune systems have evolved um, diversity as well um, via antibodies. And so all of us produce um, antibody repertoires is how we call them, um, they're also very diverse. And this diversity is meant to face the, the um, ever diverse challenges that, that come across us in our daily lives, such as you know, viruses and bacteria and so forth. Um, and in fact, our, our bodies can produce a lot of antibodies with different specificities. And so an underappreciated uh, area uh, or one at least that, that many people haven't, haven't uh, investigated in too much depth is this idea that um, to have this diverse uh, antibody repertoire, we need to start somewhere. And that starting place um, for at least most mammals is uh, the genome. And, and the genomic regions that encode antibodies tend to be uh, very diverse in themselves. And so this is what the genomic region that encodes genes that ultimately will go on to uh, generate uh, an antibody. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of explain a little bit of this to you because we'll see figures like this as we go through the presentation. And so depicted here um, are, is a region of chromosome 14 in the human genome, the very end, uh, basically right next to the telomere. Um, and in this region, which is about a megabase in length, so about a million base pairs in length, we have uh, these little green boxes, these little blue boxes, some yellow boxes, and then some additional blue boxes. And so these all form the precursors um, for the different antibodies that, that we might generate in our repertoire. And specifically, these gene segments encode the heavy chain, so the two longer paired molecules here um, shown on the left-hand side of the screen. And then uh, similarly, we have two additional regions of the genome that encode the light chain regions or the light chain part of the uh, expressed antibody. And these are termed uh, Ig lambda or Ig kappa, 
uh, IgL and IgK for short. Um, and then uh, when an antibody is being produced, you'd either have um, genes from the lambda locus or genes from the kappa locus uh, being transcribed and ultimately um, contributing to the production of the antibody. And uh, we all know, those of us who've taken um, immunology classes, that there are fairly complex mechanisms um, that ultimately lead to the generation of an antibody. Um, and these mechanisms, many of them at least, are unique to B cells, uh, and in some cases, T cells. Um, and this uh, generally happens via, we can take the heavy chain as an example here, which is kind of depicted in a, in a more simplified cartoon version at the top. Uh, we have a little cluster of B gene segments or variable gene segments. We have a little cluster of D gene segments or diversity genes and a cluster of J gene segments also called joining segments. And these genes are the, the building blocks of the variable portion of the antibody. And so when a B cell is developing, um, the DNA in that B cell from uh, starting with just one chromosome will ultimately rearrange to take a single V gene, a single D gene, and a single J gene to put them into a VDJ recombination event, which is shown here with the red, orange, and dark red boxes. And so these will ultimately form a, a VDJ rearrangement, um, which gets transcribed from the genome and ultimately spliced together with, with constant domain genes and will go on to um, make an antibody or have an antibody translated from that mRNA transcript. And so it's the joining of these different combinations of VD and J genes that gives us our initial, initial diversity in the repertoire, which we refer to as combinatorial diversity. In addition, we get Junctional diversity, which is the the uh, addition or deletion of nucleotides um, when B, B and D and D and J genes get paired together in the genome, um, and ultimately, after uh, antibodies have seen antigen or are stimulated, um, additional mutations can be introduced into these molecules um, to give them even even greater diversity. And so a lot of these mechanisms have been studied in, in pretty good detail. Um, not as much in human, although that's changing now, uh, but definitely in model organisms. But an underappreciated region, which is the area of, fo of focus for my group, um, is this idea that at the population level, we actually are learning that there's a lot of uh, genetic diversity um, among humans. And we actually have a very poor understanding of how this diversity also contributes to diversity that one might see in the antibody repertoire of a given individual, and then how that in turn might go on to influence that individual's um, immune response in different contexts. And so that's going to be a lot of what I talked to you about today, as this is the focus of uh, most of the work that my group does. And so building on that idea, um, it's been appreciated for a number of years that um, that there are lots of different alleles among the gene segments that encode antibodies. So this is an example of, of heavy chain variable genes, which we'll term IGHB genes. Um, so in human, there are around 50 some odd genes that may or may not show up in an individual's express repertoire. Um, these are shown <clears throat> along the x-axis here. And plotted on the y-axis are the number of known alleles, um, at least at in 2012 uh, for each of these genes. So you can see, this is just meant to illustrate diversity, and you can see that for some genes, there's only a couple alleles known in the human population, and for other genes, um, there are upwards of 20 alleles known. <clears throat> and so um, this, this illustrates that there's diversity, but there's, a, there's sort of a, a caveat here in that we also know, despite the fact that, that there are many alleles uh, curated um, in, in existing databases, that these databases are actually quite uh, incomplete. Um, and just to sort of illustrate this, um, it's now been apparent since I initially made this figure in 2012 that uh, many new genes, genes have been discovered. Um, and an interesting point from this um, is that most of these novel alleles uh, or novel variants that have been discovered have come from non-Caucasian samples. And so this is really illustrated to the community of researchers in this space that um, that there's a lot of sampling that still needs to be done uh, if we're going to sort of fully, more fully catalog allelic variation among the gene segments um, in the Ig regions. <clears throat>
In addition uh, to this allelic variation, we also know that um, the locus itself is very complex. And when I say it's very complex, what I mean is that it looks unlike a lot of other places in the genome. And I'll try to explain this a little bit more detail. So this is the original cartoon I showed you for the immunoglobin heavy chain locus. Um, you can see here, again, the green boxes, the blue boxes, and the, and the yellow boxes, um, indicating the different uh, gene segments. Um, and what I've shown you here are functional gene segments. So these are gene segments that typically get used um, in a repertoire. But if we actually look at the locus in more detail, and we, and we include pseudogenes, the locus looks something like this. Um, and in fact, when you look at all possible variable genes, including those that are, are, are deemed non-functional, um, you, you see that there's over 100 genes in this, in this sort of relatively small region of the genome. And what this means is that um, because these genes are all phylogenetically related, that a lot of the locus is highly repetitive. So there's a lot of sequence that you can see over and over in the region. And in fact, about, uh, well, more than 50% of, of IGH falls within what we refer to as a segmental duplication. So a region of sequence that um, is highly similar to another piece of sequence and the locus. And adding additional complexity to this, we also know that copy number variants, so gene copy number variants are, are common in locus, uh, meaning that we, have, we know that in some people, genes are either seen in zero copies, one copy, two copy, three copies, and so on. Um, and uh, because of this diversity, um, this means that no one single genome reference assembly contains all the genes that one might find uh, in, the, in the human population. And when you sort of t tally all this together, the fact that we don't know um, much about allelic diversity in the population, nor do we have a good understanding of uh, haplotype diversity when this comes to things like structural variants or copy number variants like I'm showing here, uh, it means that um, we don't actually know much about haplotype diversity in general across the human population. And because of this um, lack of data, it means that we've also historically probably not done a very good job of interrogating um, the IG loci. And this, of course, um, as one might imagine, uh, has impacted lots of different types of studies and continues to do so today. Um, so we know that things like disease association studies, like G GWAS or genome-wide association studies, have been um, impaired uh, by this deficit of data. Um, and then this sort of feeds through to um, the development of diagnostic and th therapeutic strategies, as well as understanding more basic molecular mechanisms of how these genes are regulated. And so that presents us a problem and one that we need to overcome. Um, and so this is, this is sort of the first area that, that my lab has been working on for, for a number of years now. Um, and, and when one thinks about this problem, we have to kind of decide um, where do we start? Um, in other words, how do we figure out what we know and don't know? And, and that's hard. Um, but we can take examples from some other regions of the, of the genome as well. So we have other regions like the um, human leukocyte antigen locus or HLA. We have uh, regions like those depicted here um, for the, the KIR genes. Um, all of these families are also quite complex um, and are comprised of multiple genes. And so in these other regions, what you've seen in the field are um, uh, efforts to go back and try to capture more haplotype variation. In other words, sequence more complete haplotypes to try to get a, a basic foundation of genomic resources. Uh, for these regions that can then be built on with larger population scale sequencing. And, and that's the basic model that we are actually now following. Um, and so I'm going to sort of give you some uh, additional data now um, that we've generated, um, some of which is published already and has been for a number of years, um, and, and give you an idea of, of where this project is going and how we're trying to remedy uh, this problem. And so that leads us to part one, which is um, going to focus on how we're trying to develop uh, resources and tools to improve uh, reference assemblies and, and the IG loci. And again, we're going to focus mainly on IGH here just for time, um, but much of the work we're doing um, also extends to capo and the loci as well. And so um, it's a bit uh, old school by, uh, by current terms. Um, 
But we're using, we're trying to leverage uh, what are referred to as large insert clone libraries. So these are uh, referred to as BACs, in our case, BACs or FOSMID clones. Um, and these are basically uh, libraries of uh, DNA inserts, so E. coli libraries of DNA inserts, in which the genomic, the genomic DNA from a given sample or individual has been sheared randomly, and then these sort of fragments of the of DNA are then subcloned into vectors and then immortalized in E. coli. Um, and so we've been working with libraries now, um, both BACs and FOSMIDs. Um, and these are, these are nice because each little chunk of DNA that gets uh, um, uh, inserted into these vectors can then be immortalized in an E. coli cell, which you can then go back and isolate DNA from. And you'll get an isolated piece of DNA from, the, from that individual's genome, from a single chromosome of that individual's genome. And you can go back to these clones um, in regions of interest, like I've shown here on the right, and you can actually pick clones that overlap each other and, and span a region of interest, and you can go back and sequence this. And so for complicated regions, some of this approach actually um, makes the problem much easier. So you can actually resolve the loci um, more easily than if you were, say, doing a whole genome sequencing experiment. And so one of the first resources that we used uh, several years ago now um, was a complete heterotidiform mole. And so the power of this library, the details of what a heterotidiform mole are, aren't so important, except that um, these cell lines, or this cell line in particular, has only a single chromosome uh, represented for each of all the human chromosomes. So for us, we were interested in 22, 2, and 14. Um, these, these regions we now know are haploid in this cell line. So that means we don't have to worry about things like heterozygosity uh, when it comes to assembling the loci. And so we picked clones that spanned IGH and uh, use this library to resolve uh, the first complete um, haploid uh, representation of, of the IG loci. And in addition, we sequenced in a targeted way uh, from different, uh, many different individuals of different ethnic groups, um, uh, phosphids, um, which uh, contain about 40 kb of sequence. And we would, we would basically choose phosphids from these individuals that we thought looked as though they probably contained copy number or structural variants. And so we sequenced about 30 of these um, to try to resolve additional uh, haplotype variation in the locus. And this is just kind of a brief summary. Uh, the, the data detailed in, in this work are, are um, published already, um, but I'm kind of give you a bite-sized view. So what we saw from this initial sequencing um, were uh, the presence in many of these individuals of large structural variants in the IGHV region. So, um, the sizes of these different variants. So when I say structural variants, I mean uh, big deletions or insertions in the chromosome um, that, that included gene segments. Um, and what this showed us basically is, was uh, that for many of us, some of these genes will actually not be present at all in our genomes. Um, for some of us, these genes will be present in multiple copies. Um, and it has alluded to the fact that um, diversity in the human population is probably much uh, greater than we had anticipated and newer data coming out um, is definitely supporting that notion. Um, these data also revealed um, over 200 KB of novel sequence that wasn't represented at the time um, in the Human Reference Assembly. Um, it identified novel sequences and alleles. And so um, the take home is, is that even from sequencing from a really, relatively small number of individuals, we were able to go back and start discovering a lot of novel uh, sequence in this region, um, basically highlighting the fact that th that was probably only the tip of the iceberg. And so a lot of the work we're doing now is extending on this idea. And then this is to show you the, the power of these phosmic clones, um, because you can sort of take bite-sized 40 kb segments, you can actually resolve some very complex regions of the locus. And so this region um, is a uh, quite complicated part of the IGH locus in which you have um, several gene segments that can be copied up to four times um, in one region. And what we've seen so far is in every individual we've, we've sequenced a haplotype from, it has a different number of genes and a different sort of assortment of these genes. Um, but the phosmids, despite the fact that they are a bit old school and not necessarily high throughput, do offer um, a path toward resolving some of this complexity. 
Um, and what this initial screen allowed us to do in a very targeted way is to actually go back and ask some broader population level questions about specific um, structural variants in the locus. And so the, the, I've, I've highlighted here um, three regions. So there's a green, a purple, and a red box here that are, that are denoting um, three of the structural variants that we actually went in and, and asked in a population of about 400 people of samples from different parts of the world. Um, what allele frequencies of these structural variants look like. And this is shown here. So you can see in all instances, these structural variants have different frequencies of either the insertion or deletion haplotypes um, across human populations. Um, this is really one of the first times that this had been shown for the IG regions um, at this level. And it, and it has gone to show now that, that um, many of these variants are likely going to be important for um, contributing to antibody repertoire diversity and potentially uh, broader human phenotypes. And so this was an initial look at the locus, and now a lot of what we're doing is trying to build on these ideas and do uh, much larger scale sequencing experiments. And so to, to begin this work, we have uh, again are relying on these large insert clones, and so we're now sequencing phosphates from, uh, uh, this, there's seven shown here, but we're actually sequencing eight um, and in total, uh, probably uh, two to 3,000 clones from across the heavy and light chain gene regions. And the, the intent of this is to basically sequence a bunch of phosmids um, and we, using PacBio, and we take the phosmids, we assemble them, and then we try to basically construct a haplotype from each of these individual libraries. Um, in most cases, we're hoping to, to recover two haplotypes from each individual, um, as shown here. So this is a cartoon schematic of, of um, some of the haplotype assemblies that we've generated from one of the samples. And the idea is that ultimately we'll recreate or reconstruct um, the Ig loci from both chromosomes of these uh, surveyed individuals, um, which because we're sequencing them from phosmids and using a uh, high depth of coverage of the packed bio data, we can produce very high quality assemblies for this region, um, which can then go on to serve as additional reference assemblies um, for these loci in the human uh, genome. And uh, another critical aspect of this is that we've tried to choose individuals from different human populations so that the reference assembly does a, a slightly better job of representing the different ethnic backgrounds that, that um, are, are, are often used in uh, disease uh, genetic uh, studies. And so um, we, can, we can start looking at some of these haplotypes that we're reconstructing, and this is sort of an initial pass of, of data that, that we have from six of these individuals. Um, and so when we, we start stitching the phosmids together, we can sort of reconstruct haplotypes here I've boiled those down to, again, just looking at the V segments in the region. So these, these aren't positioned by scale, but just giving you an idea of allelic variation and structural variation. So that you can see um, among these six genomes compared to the two reference assemblies shown at the very bottom, um, when you look at the little boxes, which are denoting the V genes, um, these are color coded based on what allelic variant we've, we've found. So either a known allelic variant um, which are denoted as the star and then the, the numeric, either one, two, three, you know, and so on. Or we have novel or genes that we're still processing, in other words, trying to get uh, solid assemblies before we can call alleles. But the take home here is that when you look at the segments across individuals, effectively what you see is that there are a number of genes in which you see the same allele called each time, but there are many, many genes in which that's not the case, um, in which just in these, these few haplotypes, we see lots of diversity. In addition, you see differences in the, in the number of genes present in each haplotype due to large insertions and deletions um, that we've discovered in these samples. And so this highlights that um, even in a small sample of individuals, we're already seeing that there's a lot of diversity, um, which uh, hints at the, the need to do a better job of, of characterizing this at the human, I mean, at the, excuse me, at the population level. And so then we can do, we can do a deeper dive more and, and look uh, at things like um, SNPs across the region. So in, in addition to looking at the V segment haplotypes, we can also look at uh, variants that we see across the whole locus. So this is just looking at three individuals, a representative from the Asian, African, and European populations, 
and uh, all this figure really shows is the overlap between SNPs. And so in total among these three individuals, we find about 4,000 SNPs, which is actually a lot for uh, a non-hairy cavity region of the genome, uh, particularly in only three individuals. Uh, what you can see is that most of these samples have, have a, particularly the African and European samples, have a high number of, of SNPs that aren't seen in the, in the other samples. Uh, granted, this is a small end, but this is just to sort of highlight the, the strength of these data. And then um, one thing that was actually quite surprising to us, because, because several of these samples have already been sequenced from other projects, um, including the Thousand Genomes Project, um, it was a little bit surprising that when we went in to look at SNPs um, in these samples that we found that a pretty significant portion of them had never been uh, cataloged before. Um, and so we're expecting that once we have completed our sequencing, that there's going to be a lot of novel variation at the, at the SNP level as well, um, which can obviously then be integrated into, uh, you know, variant databases um, and whatnot. And so a little biology that's already coming out of these data, um, it seems clear that IGH probably is a unique region of the genome in terms of diversity as well. So if we are to look at uh, the number of SNPs that we uh, see in the region and we compare this to other parts of the genome, uh, in this case, we're, we're comparing this to um, all the SNPs seen in each of these samples along chromosome 14. Um, we see that the density of SNPs seen in IGH is much higher than that seen elsewhere on chromosome 14. Um, in this case, it's about threefold higher in these samples and, and can be even higher depending on which, which region of the locus you look at. And if you look at this density plotted along the locus, which I've done here, um, so you can see the, the base pair position of, of IGH along the x-axis and the number of SNPs per 10 kb windows, um, you can see as you sort of slide along the IGH locus that some, some regions are actually much more SNP dense than others. Um, and, and all of our sequencing that we're doing now at a broader scale, we're seeing this trend over and over again. Um, and so this is, this is highlighting that there's likely some interesting um, genomic dynamics going on um, in this region. Okay, so that, that's, a, that's sort of a, 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 a 30,000 foot view of, of some of the approaches we're doing that um, are meant to improve the genomic uh, reference resources that are available to the community. The other aspect that we that I want to talk to you about today is how we're building on these resources to try to develop better genotyping tools. And so historically, because of the complexity of the IG regions, um, these have been very difficult to interrogate using standard high throughput methods like uh, Illumina short rate sequencing or microarray technologies. And so uh, because of that, uh, there are, there's a need for more specific uh, sequencing strategies and, and analysis tools um, in order to more fully characterize uh, genetic variation um, in these regions. And of course, the reason that we're interested in doing this is because we, one, want to understand uh, more comprehensively uh, the extent of variation in the human population, but we also want to try to understand um, how this genetic variation might contribute to variation we see in the antibody repertoire, uh, as well as um, related human phenotypes. And so uh, the, this next part, I'm going to sort of um, go through some of the data that, that we've been generating to show you the strength of, of the tools we're working on, um, as well as give you some initial biological insight into um, how, in fact, IG variants do contribute to antibody repertoire variation. And so we're generally following a model that we've put forward in that, um, that germline haplotype variation can contribute to variation that one sees in an individual's express repertoire, and that this has additional downstream correlates to other types of functional data um, that may or may not be important for informing things like uh, clinical care or uh, personalized treatments. Um, or may in fact be predictive of an individual's uh, susceptibility to you know, a, a given disease. And so um, the sort of uh, barrier in this model historically has been the ability to interrogate um, the germline haplotype. And so <clears throat> a lot of what I'm gonna be showing you in the next uh, several slides um, is, is our, our uh, attempts to sort of develop tools that overcome this. And so there's precedent for thinking that, um, that the germline uh, 
may in fact contribute to the antibody response. And this has sort of um, been highlighted as people have begun using this new, relatively new technology called antibody repertory sequencing, which allows you using uh, next-gen sequencing to um, essentially screen either the genomic VDJ rearrangements or VDJ rearrangements expressed in um, an RNA sample to uh, capture um, the diversity that's seen at, at the, uh, within an individual's expressed antibody repertoire. Um, and this method is, is becoming quite pervasive now um, and is telling us all sorts of things about um, the function of B cells and, and how antibodies contribute to an immune response. Um, and one of the things that we learned sort of a basic level is we, we using this approach, we can, we can start understanding how often particular uh, genes within the, in this case, the IGH locus get used in an individual's repertoire. And this can then be applied to many samples and we can, we can try to see which genes might be most important for particular responses or how variable um, uh, individual repertoires are compared to another uh, persons in the population. And so this is just sort of a, um, a small snapshot of what these data uh, might look like. So this is showing you the frequency of each of the V genes noted on the um, uh, x-axis as it appears in the individual's repertoire. In this case, we're looking at um, two monozygotic twin pairs, A and B, which are denoted by the different colored bars. And so you can see some genes are used relatively uh, at relatively low levels in the repertoire, and some genes are used at, at higher levels. Um, and this, is, this has been sh sort of shown over and over as people have done more and more sequencing like this. But what some of these early studies uh, showed, this one in particular um, by Jay Glanville in 2011, um, was that uh, one notable finding is that the frequencies at which genes are used actually are more tightly correlated in monozygotic twins than compared to unrelated individuals. And what this told us at the time was that there is actually probably a genetic correlate or underpinning for repertoire diversity. Um, this had sort of been appreciated um, several decades ago, um, but hadn't really been um, looked at this comprehensively. And so this was a big motivator for the work that we do because it suggests that in fact, um, variation within the immunoglobulin regions, genetic variation could be contributing to, to this particular um, uh, feature um, in, that, in that there is a uh, higher concordance of monozygotic twin repertoires compared to unrelated people. And in fact, um, in a target study that we worked on, um, we wanted to look at a particular region um, uh, that encodes the gene IGHV169 um, which is known to have many different allelic uh, forms, but mainly uh, two forms um, that either encode a, a, a phenylalanine at position 54 or a leucine at, at position 54. And this gene is also known to vary in copy numbers. So some individuals will carry two copies in, the, in their genome, and other individuals may carry three or four. And we wanted to ask quite simply, um, can we assay this, vari this genetic variation and see if that contributes to the different types of V169 antibodies that we observe in repertoire? And in fact, when we did this, we saw that both the copy number variant and the allele coding variant um, correlated with uh, the, the usage of that gene in, in individual naive repertoires. And so th these two charts show that. So uh, the top one, uh, looks at the copy number variant. So individuals that have um, either 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4 copies of the F-type allele of 169 um, have varying levels of expression. Um, so those with 0 have the lowest, and those with, with 4 copies have the highest expression. Uh, similarly, we saw that individuals who have uh, or who are homozygous for the leucine-leucine variant have the lowest expression of V169, and those with phenylalanine, homozygous for ph the phenylalanine variant, have the highest expression of V169. And so this, this uh, gives credence to the monozygotic twin study, uh, which has also been replicated, I should say, a, a couple times now, um, in that it's actually showing that some of the variation, genetic variation that may be contributing to this um, to the heritability of repertoires is probably going to be located in the, in the IG loci themselves. 
And so this was just a targeted, a targeted variant uh, or targeted study looking at um, a single variant. Um, but as I told you several slides before, we know that there are thousands and thousands of, of genetic variants in the, in the IGH locus. And so we needed a way to, to uh, do this more comprehensively, but still in a high throughput manner. Oh, and I should say that um, in addition to showing these features, we also looked at these particular variants um, in different human populations. And we saw that there was a pretty extensive uh, variation between different ethnic groups. So we observed that with respect to the gene copy number variant and the coding variant, that there were uh, 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 different uh, frequencies um, depending on what your ethnic background was. And so on the left here, you can see that copy number variation tends to be higher in African samples and lower in Asian samples. And similarly, the uh, F alleles are at much higher prevalence in African samples compared to individuals of, of uh, South Asian populations. And so what this highlighted was that, um, you know, if there's any functional features associated with this gene, um, that, that there may be variation in the phenotype level depending on uh, what your ethnic background is. And so, as I said, we needed to come up with ways to do this in a more high throughput fashion. And so we um, started several years ago developing an approach to um, target IGH. So in other words, um, try to specifically pull down DNA fragments from a given sample for the IGH locus um, and sequence these using PacBio. And we wanted to use PacBio because we wanted to leverage the long read sequencing uh, that PacBio offers because we knew that um, standard approaches using, uh, say, Illumina sequencing or short reads um, tended to be uh, very problematic um, for the IG locus, primarily due to, to the complexity and the lack of, of uh, more complete resources. And so this is just a general cartoon of how this works. You essentially um, design targets, um, oligo targets, to your region of interest, in this case IGH, and you pull down those DNA fragments um, and you size select them to about five to eight KB in, in, um, in size range. And then you essentially take those enriched fragments and you, you make a sequencing library. Um, and effectively, um, once we do this, we can then sequence it on the pack bio and use those data to try to reconstruct um, haplotypes for IGH and call genetic variation. And of course, the, the, the advantages to this approach are that it's, it's relatively high throughput compared to WGS and, and less, less expensive than whole genome sequencing. Um, and in comparison to other strategies that currently exist, um, the long reads give us uh, a better ability to actually resolve um, com complex parts of the IGH locus. Um, in addition to this bench method, we've also been developing um, bioinformatic tools to deal with these data um, and these, these effectively allow us to take the reads, uh, map them to the locus, and try to uh, phase SNPs and phase the reads accordingly, and then reconstruct two haplotypes um, across the region, um, which then can be annotated, and uh, SNPs and gene variants and copy number variants, et cetera, can be called from these data. This is just an example of a region in which we can do this. So you can see for these three samples, um, we have three diploid samples, one, two, three, and a single uh, haploid sample. And you can see there's a presence of uh, multiple SNPs in these samples um, in this region shown by the little blue and green ticks. And we can use these, these, read, uh, these SNPs within the reads to partition um, blue and green reads here into two different haplotypes. And then we can do assemblies. This approach ultimately allows us to do things like B-gene haplotyping, akin to what I've shown you with some of the other figures in, in the previous slides. Um, so in other words, this offers a high throughput way to sort of uh, do some of the, the haplotyping-based sequencing that we've, that we've been doing for the last few years. Um, and then we can, we can take information on known copy number variants or structural variants, and we can use that information to um, effectively integrate different methods to uh, call those structural variant genotypes in any sample and then extrapolate this out to the population level. So for this, this particular insertion deletion variant, which involves about 60 kb of sequence, 
Um, we can do things like assess read depth and, and conduct local assemblies and make SNP calls and then ultimately generate um, SV genotypes for that, that particular event across samples. Um, that's uh, all something that's been quite challenging to do um, uh, until now using genomic approaches. And so what we're currently doing now is um, because we ultimately want to understand how this variation contributes to the immune response, we're conducting some of the first studies um, trying to do just that. So we want to genotype a bunch of people using this approach and then look in their express antibody repertoires to see if we can associate some of these germline variants uh, with variation that we see in the repertoire. And so we've done this now in about 50 healthy adults. Um, and this is a general model, so it's just following a general EQTL model or expressing a uh, quantitative trait locus model um, in which you can essentially uh, take genotypes or haplotype information from a sample and you can ask, does that sample or does that, excuse me, do, does that genotype contribute to um, the, the observed usage of a given B segment um, in the repertoire? So this, these are a couple of hypothetical examples shown on the right here in, in these uh, uh, box plots. So you can see um, for the V gene one, we're asking do things like uh, gene deletions, for example, contribute to the uh, expression of that gene in the repertoire, um, or do, for example, other regulatory variants contribute to the expression of, of uh, V genes? Um, and um, the data set we have, um, we we have sequenced all 50 of these samples using our protocol, and. Uh, in total, have generated almost uh, a, a sort of high quality call set of about 6,000 SNPs. Um, CMV uh, calling is still in progress. Um, and we can then take repertoire data, IgM repertoire data from these individuals, uh, on which we have uh, usage metrics for about 57 IgHb genes. And then we can essentially ask for the associations between genetic variants and uh, gene expression. And what we see when we do this. Um, in fact, is that there are uh, lots of associations. And so here, this, this chart um, shows for all the B segments that we have reliable data on, um, uh, the top most associated SNP, statistically speaking, uh, with the usage of that gene. Um, and so shown on the x-axis here is minus log 10 p-value, and on the y are all the gene segments that we've, uh, that we've assayed. And you can see here that for many of them, um, if you use sort of a nominal p-value cutoff, uh, for many of them, um, there is a, a significant, at least one SNP that is significantly associated with this expression. So in this case, in this data set, there are 39 out of 57 genes that we screened have at least one SNP that's associated with its usage. Um, and then for many of these, we can we sort of get uh, internal validation within this data set because we see clusters of SNPs um, that are associated with a given gene. So in this case, again, um, the, the genes are shown on the y-axis, and uh, instead on the x-axis this time, we have the number of SNPs that um, are associated with each gene, with the expression of each gene at, at the cutoff of minus log 10 equal to 4. Um, and you can see for many of these genes that there's over 100 uh, SNPs um, that will associate with, with its usage. So showing that, in fact, that there definitely are genetic correlates um, within the IG regions. So I'm going to show you a couple of these just to sort of illustrate the, that, they, that they already are highlighting the fact that there are probably different sort of regulatory mechanisms um, underlying uh, uh, VDJ recombinations involving these genes. And so this is a relatively straightforward one. So this is just a, a single sort of cluster of SNPs, as you can see in this Manhattan plot on the left. So this is basically showing... Um, the IGH locus from left to right um, and its position along, along chromosome 14. Um, each of the dots shown are um, a p-value for associate SNP um, and its association to the expression of IGH v461. And so all the black dots are genes in which, or excuse me, are SNPs that did not have a significant p-value, and all the salmon-colored dots or pink dots are um, SNPs that did have a nominally significant um, association with, with usage of 461. And um, what I've done is, is highlight in red circle there the, the top associated SNP for 461. 
and that is shown as a box plot over here so you can get an idea of what the usage frequency looks like with each genotype. Um, given that we only have 50 subjects, um, there's only one individual who is a TT homozygote, but you, you can see that the trend is, is quite clear um, and that CC homozygotes um, have much lower expression of 461 compared to the heterozygotes and the homozygotes. That's a relatively simple one where you have this a single cluster of SNPs correlating with just a single gene. Um, then we have we see some other <clears throat> some other interesting patterns. So this is a really highly significant um, effect. And so this one we initially noted for the gene uh, IGHV3-9. Um, as you can see, there's a pretty tall peak there of associated SNPs. But when we look, look closer at this, we actually saw that this SNP also correlated with the expression of multiple genes aside from 3-9. And when you go back and, and you look um, more at the region, um, it's clear that this SNP is likely uh, tagging a known structural variant haplotype. Um, and so we, we know that already that individuals on their chromosomes can either carry a haplotype that includes uh, the gene 3-9 and 1-8, or they can include a haplotype that um, has the genes 5-10-1 or 364-D. And in fact, what you see here is that this SNP um, correlates with genes um, in such a way that um, it, there are inverse effects um, depending on which haplotype is, is clearly being tagged by the SNP. So individuals who are CC uh, have low expression of 3-9, but have higher expression of 364-D and 5-10-1, for example. Um, and so that's just obviously a, a structural variant um, that's, that's leading to this effect. And then we are also interested in going back and looking at the gene I mentioned before, B169, uh, because we, we had previously shown that there is an effect of genetic variation in this gene. Um, and this gene is also known to have um, uh, uh, an important role in the development of broadly neutralizing antibodies for influenza. And so we went back and looked at this one. And in fact, again, we do, we do indeed see um, very strong genetic effects uh, for 169 expression. Um, in this case, the cluster is, is quite large and complex and also includes a large structural variant, which, which we already knew about for 169. Um, and an interesting thing about this is that this SNP also has inverse effects on other genes um, in the locus, um, aside from 169. And so again, you see something similar to what we showed in the previous slide in which um, GG homozygotes may have low 169 expression, but they have higher expression of 366 and 459. Um, the mechanisms that, that are, are underlying this are currently unknown, um, but I think these data are going to help us start getting at some of these questions. So an interesting note about that particular step is that it does, it does reside uh, within a CTCF um, and DNAs1 signal um, from the ENCODE data sets. Um, CTCF in particular is a, um, has been shown to be involved in VDJ recombination, so that might be a good candidate uh, regulatory mechanism for uh, this particular effect. And so with that, um, I'm going to, to leave you with the conclusion slide. Um, so I hope today that the data we've, we've, we've discussed give you the, uh, the take home that um, the IG loci are extremely complex at the genomic level and also highly polymorphic, and that this has uh, several consequences for how we think about um, the role of Ig variation in, in uh, B cell function, antibody function, and ultimately disease, um, and that this sort of lack of knowledge um, highlights a need for improved genomic resources. Um, so that we can begin developing better methods for interrogating genetic variation at the IGH locus. Um, I also hope that you are walking away from this talk feeling convinced that indeed the IG loci probably do um, uh, contribute to, to variation we see in the antibody response and that, um, that, that there are likely roles for IG variation in uh, probably important clinical phenotypes um, not to mention that, um, that doing these types of analyses are probably going to be uh, key first steps in trying to understand the molecular mechanisms that, that influence BDJ recombination, at least in humans. Um, and for us, you know, uh, the plans are to keep extending this work um, and start applying our approaches to larger cohorts, um, including those um, 
that uh, include disease, you know, individuals with disease um, or, or different clinical phenotypes of interest. Um, and these will also be able to move into animal models um, so that we can better assess the, the different molecular mechanisms that play for BDJ recombination and repertory development. And so with that, I have lots of people to acknowledge. This has uh, been a pretty big effort and continues to be from, from uh, different groups. So my group at the University of Louisville, um, primarily William Gibson, who's been leading a lot of the FOSMID and um, uh, capture work on the bench side. Um, and then at Mount Sinai, we have uh, Oscar Rodriguez has been doing most of the computational development. Um, uh, and Melissa Laird-Smith at Mount Sinai, the assistant director of the Tech Dev Corps there, has been doing um, all the sequencing for this project, which is a huge undertaking. Um, and Ali Bashir, uh, who mentors Oscar uh, and, uh, on the uh, computational development. And then um, definitely uh, to Wayne Morasco at the Dana-Farber um, who has been working with me on many of these ideas for many years, um, whose samples were used for the initial EQTL study. Um, and with that, I will thank you for your attention. Um, please feel free to send any uh, questions on my talk, and I will get back to you um, uh, via email. Um, thanks, and have a good one.